Uh, it's fantastic to see so many people. So thank you so much, uh, first off, for, for staying around uh, and for watching this. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about platform engineering for software developers and architects. Now, I'll introduce myself a bit more in a moment to give you some context. But I always like to start my talks with a kind of high-level key takeaways, the TLDRs, if you like. These are the three things I would like you to walk away from today. I'm conscious your head is probably exploding with knowledge already, but these are the three things. The first is platform engineering should have a product focus. Devs are customers. We're not just trying to shoehorn DevOps in under a different name. I've heard that a few times, right? Not such a good look. I'm also wanting you to get you thinking around platform architecture and software architecture, a symbiotic, maybe even one and the same thing. There's no excuses now for shipping stuff and hoping the platform team are going to run it, right? And vice versa, platforms should be supporting devs along the way too. And finally, good APIs, abstractions, and automation, the three A's, I like to say, are, are the prize for everything. We're not just looking to swap out tools or looking for that one single process. There's still, you know, I'm going to say it a few times, but software engineering is a team sport. You definitely want to minimize collaboration sometimes or um, reduce sort of handoffs, but it's a team sport. This is me at Daniel Bryant uh, UK on most of the interwebs. I've got more involved in Blue Sky this week after Kelsey jumped on, and I'm sure many of you are the same, right? Uh, my background is Java development. Uh, 20 years ago, showing my age a little bit, I started coding in Java, did JavaScript, did more architecture stuff, then moved to ops, CTO roles. I jokingly say my job titles are like Pokemon. I am trying to collect them all, right? I love learning. I love sharing knowledge. I've written some books with some friends. I regularly write on InfoQ, and I've worked on a bunch of open source projects, currently Cratix, but also OpenJDK in the past, Emissary Ingress, Telepresence, I'm sure you'll recognize that too. So let's wind it back a little bit. We're going back two and a half years now, uh, two and a half years ago, at, at KubeCon Valencia. I talked about from Kubernetes to Paz to what is next. And I said golden paths are the key things. I was looking at what Spotify were doing and others. I said the real question you need to ask is, how do you build this yourself, or how much should you build by blend? And what's the control plane looking like for developers? Right? And this is, again, two and a half years ago, platform engineering was just bubbling up a little bit. It was becoming a thing. And, and now, look where we are. We had an amazing PlatEng day here uh, you know, a few days ago. I talked about my dev career, right? So sort of down the, uh, the axis on the side was like my 20-year uh, dev career, and you could see my cognitive load throughout the years. The more red, the, the worse, right? When I started moving into J um, Java, service-oriented architectures, I was having to interact with the platform more, the enterprise service bus, the message queues, and deploying my app was a multi-phase situation. Uh, my cognitive load went up. As I moved on to doing some Spring and some uh, Cloud Foundry and some Ruby on Rails and some um, Heroku, everything got easy again. I was literally firing up my build pack, writing my code, CF push, happy days. And if anything went wrong, I was in the new Relic dashboard, looking around, could usually figure out what was, what was going on, and I could fix it. And then microservices happened, right? Um, lots of Terraform, lots of cross-plane bash. I was learning about cloud. I loved it. I must be honest, my cognitive load was high, but I loved it. But many of the teams I was consulting to as an architect back home in the UK did not like it. The developers just wanted to write code, code, ship, and run, right? They didn't want to get involved in learning the ins and outs of AWS, GCP, Azure, or Terraform, or Crossplane. I was talking a lot about the CNCF being a foundation for a developer control plane. I was working at Ambassador Labs at the time, so not just my ideas, it was the whole team's ideas. And we sort of said, hey, there's all these things at the bottom, tools for coding, for shipping, for running. That's what I want to do as a developer, right? And there's a bunch of tools, a bunch of kind of abstractions you recognize above, like dev environments and continuous delivery and that kind of good stuff. But the interesting thing, two and a half years ago, was happening here. Now, when I say backstage, it's obvious now, right? But at the time, we weren't really sure. There was backstage, there was clutch. Now we've got port, we've got cortex, we've got lots of interesting technology at the portal layer. That layer below was interesting, though. I didn't know what to call it, right? I've got there sort of like about building integrated workflows. And this, I think, now is what we're calling platform orchestration. It's kind of the middle layer between portals and infrastructure. It's where the rubber meets the road as a developer. This is important. 
Let's wind back a little bit. I want to establish kind of base levels, right? So the what of platforms, what is a platform even? I like Evan Botch's definition, fantastic definition, not just Evan, the ThoughtWorks folks, like Rebecca Parsons, Martin Fowler, Azure McDehani, there's many involved in with this definition, but I like this a lot. Evan talks that a digital platform is a foundation for self-service APIs, tools, services, knowledge, and support that are arranged into a compelling internal product. Got those words already, right? Compelling internal product. And I like the way he pulls out, it's not just tools, it's knowledge and it's support. We're working in socio-technical systems, right? People, technology. He focused on autonomous delivery teams can make use of the platform to deliver product features at a higher pace with reduced coordination. I like this a lot. He's not saying no coordination. Like definitely when I started my career as a de de developer, I'm like, I don't want to talk to ops. Right, it's like cats and dogs, right? He's not saying that, he's saying reduced coordination. There's always some element of coordination between platform and between developers. Platform engineering is the thing we do to create platforms, right? And I like what Gartner have put here. You know when Gartner arrive, it's serious, right? Like you know, proper enterprise play, right? And they, they focus again on improving developer experience, focusing on self-service capabilities, and automating infrastructure operations. We're going to come back to this image later on as well, but I really like this as a mental model. Always, know, always think about what are the goals of your platform. And the reason I put this slide up is because a lot of folks now are spinning up platform teams. And if you spin up a platform team, I guarantee you, you're going to get a platform. Right? It may not do what you want, but you're going to get a platform. So always think about what are the goals of your platform. This was the bugbear of my, uh, my sort of job 10 years ago where I was going in doing platform rescues, and people were like, I'm just building an internal AWS. And I'm like, do your developers want that? And they were like, I don't know. I've not talked to them. And that was, that was where the problem started. Right? What are the goals of your platform? Go faster. I'm pitching everything as a service, rapidly sustain valuable, uh, value to end users. Decrease risk. You want to automate your manual processes into reusable components. This is key. And you want to increase efficiency, right? You need to manage and scale your platform and resources as a fleet. This is not new, right? And the team topologies folks have really done an amazing job of explaining the socio bit behind the socio-technical systems here. If you have not read that book, on the flight home, grab yourself a copy, totally worth it. Emmanuel, uh, Matthew and Manuel, lucky enough to know them, and they are legit good practitioners in this space. Gregor's book, also amazing, amazing uh, platform strategy. I'm actually going to meet Gregor next week. It's super cool in, in San Francisco. That should be good fun to catch up with him again. Um, he's got a bunch of amazing work. And one thing, one thing I want to sort of pick up on, on this um, slide is he talks a lot about the software architect elevator. And he talks about like, the, the sort of things we do as being like a building with the C-level folks, the SVPs being in the penthouse, and the rest of us getting the work done like in the boiler room. Right? And you've got to ride that elevator. There's middle management. There's compliance, regulation. I like the metaphor. I know it's a bit strange, but roll with me. One thing Gregor says is you have to use the right language for the right part of the building. If you're at sea level, basically the three things here are make me more money, keep me off the front page of the newspapers, and save me money. Make sense? If you're a developer, you want to be thinking about things like keep me in flow. Um, give me fast feedback, reduce my cognitive load for go faster. For decreased risk, it's things like shift things left, make it easy to do the right thing in terms of security, observability, all that good stuff. And increased efficiency is like, give me abstractions that kind of scale. I want to have roughly the same idea of like uh, a process, a compute node, a cluster. They should be kind of similar abstractions, right? But I really like the way that Gregor's always saying, make sure you meet people where they're at communicate appropriately. Talking of architecture, this is onto the platform architecture slide now. And as with all models, they're wrong. Some are useful, right? Uh, and I hope this model is useful. And again, coming as a Java developer, I love three tiers. So that's what I'm going with, right? Three tier model. I think the first layer is not controversial. You, you know, you'll recognize it. Uh, it's where you code, ship, run, what I talked about earlier on. This is the area of the app developers, the full stack engineers, a little bit of DevOps maybe. This is where we're seeing portals now, CLI, declarative config. There's a bunch of tools there you can check out too. The infrastructure composition layer, I don't think is controversial either. It's where you're planning, you're building, you're maintaining. This is the realm of traditionally sysadmins, operators, 
I did my fair bit of racking and stacking back in the day, right? And now we're writing infrastructure as code, as DevOps engineers, uh, as uh, platform engineers as well. This is the realm. Terraform, crossplane, all that good stuff. The area where it's a bit more novel is what I'm calling, and many people, to be fair, I'm, again, standing on the shoulders of giants, right, is the platform orchestration layer. This is the de designing, the enabling, the optimizing your platform layer. This is the realm of platform engineers, engineering enablement, uh, developer experience engineers, DX engineers, and you're focused here on the platform API and the platform lifecycle. And that is a higher level of abstraction than infrastructure. Some tools there, I obviously work, for Kratik, uh, I work with Kratix as an open source tool. Humanity, I've got resource definitions, cross-plane compositions I put in this space, and things like the Argo workflows and, and Flux, I also put in this level as well. But again, thinking about the platform abstraction. Now, it's kind of good to me. I, li I like when smarter people than me are saying similar things, right? Because in kind of isolation, things have popped up. The Gartner diagram I showed earlier, I can see three layers there again. I can see the portals, I can see the orchestration layer, and I can see the infrastructure layer. Keith Morris, fantastic book. I remember reading this book back in 2016, the first edition. It was the go-to reference for building infrastructure as code as a developer. The, now, uh, I think Keith's on the third edition. I've just reviewed, and a bunch of us have reviewed the third edition. It's being published, I think, next month or so. And Keith and I were chatting in London, uh, luckily, at PlatformCon earlier in the year. And he was like, hey, your three-tier model is the same as my model. I've called it something different, but it's pretty much the same thing, which I was like, ooh, you know, interesting, kind of like we're seeing the same thing. And then literally, I was in New York for a few uh, days before coming to Salt Lake City, and I was reading Camille and Ian's awesome book on the flight over from New York to here, and ta-da, the architecture drawing going popped up. I could see the three tiers again, right? I could see the application, the glue code, the messy, the messy, sorry, the messy middle, and I could see the infrastructure at the bottom. And Camille and Ian even went on to say, hey, here's how you build paved roads. And I was like, oh man, this is amazing. This book will re repeatedly come back in the presentation. It's a, it's a really good book. I only read it like, a few days ago, but it's, I've followed Camille for years and, and Ian, they're, they're awesome. So I think focus on this layer, right? I see uh, portals pushing down into this layer. Ports, backstage cortex are sort of putting in lifecycle management into their, um, their, their tools. I see uh, Crossplane, Terraform pushing up into this layer. But as a, as a Java developer, as an architect, I like my boundaries. I like my separation, right? I like the principle of least surprise. And that's why I think designing platforms with these three tiers in mind is very helpful. We as software developers can teach the platform folks something, hopefully. So now I'm going to run you through some architecture case studies, quick check of time there. Uh, and I'm going to run through hexagonal architecture, uh, microservices, a little bit of cell-based architecture. And I'm going to give you some of the history and try and join the dots between platform engineering and software uh, engineering as well. First off, hexagonal architecture, ports and adapters, it's got a bunch of names. I think it was Alistair Cockburn, I want to say, that um, sort of formalized it a few, many years ago now, to be fair. Uh, and this is kind of the, the model you see on screen. The idea being that you can create cohesive business code, uh, and then you have interfaces, ports and adapters, into the platform layers. So you're, you're interfacing into a database or a queue or some kind of transaction management, right? Great for testing, because you can just mock the interfaces. Love that. And in theory, it's promoted your loose coupling. The famous thing as a Java developer was you could swap out your databases. I think in my 10-year Java dev career, I created like, loads of interfaces, only ever swapped out a database once. But it was possible, right? My SQL to Postgres, we did it. <laughs> and with minimal impact to the engineers. The reason this kind of architecture pattern popped up is that layered and tiered apps were often highly coupled. The classic example is like putting business logic in like web pages. Maybe we're seeing that a little bit of portals now, to be fair. I'm seeing business logic being put in portals. Always a bit dangerous uh, having your business logic in presentation layers. But we also pushed a lot of um, business logic down into the platform. Uh, database triggers. If anyone's as old as me, you can recognize database triggers and like transactional SQL, horrible, hard to debug, <laughs> because it, was, um, it wasn't cohesive and it was highly coupled to the implementation. I remember a particular enterprise service buses. I often deploy my application code to a, a, a target, like a server. I had to then deploy code to an ESB, and like it was all highly coupled, nightmare. EJBs had this notion of hiding when you were going over the wire. So you had like a single interface or two interfaces with remote and home. And, but we all know when you're doing something over the wire, 
that is massively different than doing something on a local process, right? And there was too much magic there. I was building systems that were working really well locally, and when we deployed them, the magic kind of disappeared, right? Same thing with, um, this is not Docker containers, it's like other things, container managed transactions. The semantics were hidden from me as a developer. In theory, the abstraction they gave me allowed me to do you know, um, cross-scaling transactions across queues, across databases, but it never quite worked right, and debugging it, debugging the magic was really hard. The pushback we saw was software solutions, right? Netflix famously pioneered Netflix OSS stack, which made its way into Java Spring as well, which was, was interesting. You're wrapping platform components in custom code, the classic being you take some kind of like proxy, maybe written in C++, and you wrap it in like Java, and then you can expose that to developers. You give them Java libraries, Java SDKs, but then there's high coupling, right? If you're not writing on the JVM, if you want to spin up TypeScript or something, like you have to rewrite the library to interface with the platform, which was a bit, bit hard. And you had to kind of go all in on the Netflix stack, which I always was a bit reluctant to do. What I saw, and to be fair, Netflix even did it with their Prana project. They put sidecars up where they exposed these Java services via HTTP APIs. So other languages could make use of these um, platform services over the wire, right? Um, you um, still need to think about like deploying your platform infrastructure, your actual services, but sidecars, and I'm really a big fan of Dapper, right? So uh, Dapper graduated, kudos to the Dapper folks one, once again. Um, really big fan of Dapper because it gives you this notion of uh, sort of SDKs and libraries, but loosely coupled into uh, components for building distributed systems. And again, if we look at that diagram, I can kind of see three tiers there, right? I can see the application, I can see the uh, platform sort of orchestration layer, the abstractions, and I can see the infrastructure, which I quite liked. I want to get you thinking, like, and something I literally chatted to uh, the CEO of, of Syntasa, where I work, a couple of weeks ago. We were talking about golden paths, and we're actually thinking a lot of these abstractions that we all like as engineers, we're quite bullish on Dapper, we're quite bullish on Dagger, too. Like, it's about building golden bricks, not golden paths. If I give you a golden brick as a platform engineer, you can assemble that as a, as a developer to, like, create the, the paved road, the golden path that you want. Golden bricks versus golden paths. I'm still mulling this over. Colin like, uh, got me thinking, but like, I haven't fully formed the thought. But I like the idea, right? If we look at microservices now, mo services, mo problems, right? The thing with microservices, it was all about, you know, we, we, we learned a lot with the hexagonal architecture, but we're still building monoliths. And like, it was really hard to work on individual bits of the code base, like tripping over each other, hard to scale. The blast radius is really high when stuff went wrong. So we thought, hey, let's take this hexagonal architecture and expand it out even more to create these kind of tightly um, cohesive, highly cohesive uh, business functional, uh, business sort of um, services offering type functionality. But Martin Fowler, again, the ThoughtWorks folks, always astute saying, you need these things, rapid provisioning, basic monitoring, rapid app deployment, to make this a reality. And again, I was consulting about 10 years ago on, on this stuff when Sam Newman was just writing his book. It wasn't you know, fully a thing, right? Um, I saw a lot of challenges where ops were taking, say, three months to, write, uh, to deploy a database. So what the smart architects and developers were doing were over provisioning their request, saying, hey, I need this really big database. And three months time, when it came to deploy, they dump all their schema on this one database. The challenge is that once it's all on one database, it's tempting then to just link stuff and make a call across databases, across schema. Before you know it, you've got a distributed monolith. Like, you have to deploy all the things at once to make it work. The platform dictated the architecture there, which I was like, oh, that's, you know, I get it. Like, we need this ability to rapidly roll out infrastructure. Can't rely on tickets anymore. Martin, Rebecca Parsons, all the crew at ThoughtWorks were on point, right? DevOps obviously popped up, and I love, love me some DevOps, for sure, but it doesn't always scale. The thing is, when you're in a bank or a regulated environment, you can't have 10 ways. We, we literally saw this in the panel with Rachel and team earlier on. You can't have 10 ways or 100 ways of doing a security. The auditors are going to want to look at every one of those ways, right? If you've got 100 ways of doing observability, the auditors are going to be looking at 100 different things. Like, it's going to take forever. You, DevOps is great as a principle, but you do need, often in regulated environments, some notion of centralization for like these core um, primitives for like uh, observability and, and security and that good stuff. So, 
What kind of happened there? Infrastructure solutions popped up. I think at one end of the scale, we had Heroku. At the other end of the scale, we had like Cloud Foundry. Heroku was great for small businesses. Heroku, uh, sorry, Cloud Foundry was really good for bigger businesses. You had to kind of go all in with Cloud Foundry to get the most value out of it. The service brokers, the marketplaces. Uh, and Heroku, the challenge with Heroku is that it didn't always scale. And there's a fantastic talk by an ex-colleague of mine and a friend, uh, Dave Sudia. Uh, he talked about GoSpotCheck's journey from Heroku onto Kubernetes, because GoSpotCheck was doing really well, and Heroku simply couldn't scale up. And I'm not ragging on Heroku, because it's a fantastic bit of kit. Like, they were growing like gangbusters, right? And, and uh, Dave and Tony Ripp, his colleague, did a talk at Coupon San Diego about three, four years ago now. So you can check that one out on, on YouTube. If you fell into the middle, if you weren't small enough for Heroku, and you weren't really big enough for Cloud Foundry, you often did the app scaffolding, or as we jokingly at Syntaxo like to say, puppy for Christmas, right? And this is where you as a developer are often given a bundle of Terraform, like, hey, you want to run your app? Here's your Terraform. Stands it up on day one, happy days, right? Much like that puppy, first day of Christmas, woo! -hoo! Day two, you're cleaning up the mess. Day three, you're out walking the puppy, right? And suddenly you realize, like, oh, you know, I've got to be responsible as a dog owner, right? Same deal with this infrastructure uh, as a code. Uh, I saw a lot of teams being given sort of bootstrap scripts, templates, and then being expected to manage that over the long haul. And this was quite a challenge. We're seeing um, solutions in the space now, right? Workload definitions, OAM, uh, the cross-plane folks are heavily involved in that. We're seeing SCORE and now CNCF Sandbox Project, and we're seeing things like Radius from the uh, Microsoft folks. We're trying to get that Goldilocks abstraction here. We're seeing platform uh, orchestrations like Kratix. I think I even got like a logo there. Yeah. Kratix, FusionStack, Humanitech platform orchestrator that are offering uh, or enabling you to build platforms to offer everything as a service. It harks back to Cloud Foundry, but a bit more flexible in, in kind of implementation. You can spin up your Java services, spin up your um, platform tasks, your security, your databases. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, I love the idea of Dagger for codifying my CI CD. I think I've got a Dagger graphic. You kind of have to squint and turn your head a little bit to see the three layers in the dagger um, diagram, but hopefully you can. There is roughly application, roughly platform, roughly infrastructure. Kratix is even more obvious at the top, sort of the three layers there, but it's getting the right abstractions. Again, golden bricks, not necessarily golden paths. Both dagger allows me to build these golden bricks and compose them again together. Kratix allows me to build these golden bricks and compose them together. Still thinking on it, but I quite like this idea of golden bricks. I'm only going to give one slide on cell-based architecture. I so I help out the InfoQ folks, and we've seen a lot of buzz. A lot of uh, regulated companies, again, now are building cell-based architectures. And it's kind of an evolution of microservices. Um, it's all about um, creating sort of uh, lower blast radius, uh, radiuses, radii, <laughs> uh, and uh, improving uh, isolation and fault containment. And you can kind of spin up these cells on demand. I know your customer cell, a fraud detection cell, all this kind of thing. And we're seeing a lot of technology in our space, right, like cluster API, horizontal pod autoscalers, vertical, CADA is really popular at the moment. And we're seeing more advanced routing now with the Kubernetes gateway and open service mesh and things like that. I do think, though, that at the moment, we haven't got the abstractions right. As developers, we want to have abstractions that kind of scale all the way up. At the moment, dealing with a process or dealing with a node, dealing with a cluster is very different. So I think platform engineers need to help us with, with that kind of thing. So just like get you thinking, fleet management, I think, is a thing. If you start, um, do you want to know more about cell-based architectures? My friend, Raphael, put this uh, EMAG together. It's got a bunch of articles in there about uh, AWS and other folks that are doing cell-based architectures. So super interesting. So, key insights. Given that architectural tour, I wanted to pull out a few things for us as, as developers thinking about you know, uh, building platforms. Abstract thinking is key here, right? Things like solid, cupid, principle of least surprise. So like solid, you know, single responsibility, open, closed principle. Cupid's like composable, Unix philosophy. Uh, the, I almost forget some of these things. But we often need to educate the platform folks on these kind of things, right? So like, don't just throw away all your good software engineering knowledge. You want to be like, you know, educating the platform folks on this stuff too. And I've stolen this quote from Elaine Chisa, creator of Dark Lang. I should have quoted her properly, but I have linked her um, a, a talk there, I think it is. Developers don't want magic. They want to be magicians, yeah? You have to think about the size of the spell. 
cue some chat GPT generated graphics, mandatory, right? Um, but I, I really like this, yeah, because I recognize sometimes when I was given magic as a developer in the platform and it hid all the abstractions away, I was like, oh, what's going on? Like, I wanted to be a magician. I wanted to understand the trick, right, so that I could debug it when it went wrong. So Elaine, Elaine's done some amazing work in this space. Uh, she's working at Bold Start VC now and writes on, on Medium. Her stuff's really good, so definitely recommend that. I've said this in other talks, you can't have good developer experience without good user experience, right? So design your control planes for APIs first, then look at CLIs, then look at UIs. I think it's a temptation at the moment to go all in on portals. And I'm not gonna be super negative on portals, right? Because I, I, you know, I use them, I like them. But I think if you optimize for automation, you can layer on things like CLI tools and UIs on top much easier than if you're reverse engineering a portal into an API. Right? I think we as developers perhaps get that more easily than platform engineers. Controversial statement, maybe, I'm not sure, but just have a think about that one. You wanna to aim to minimize cognitive load, and for me, a real good way of doing this is building for progressive disclosure. And this, I'm gonna hat tip Sevi Kim. Sevi, you may be in the audience. I've bumped into him once here today. Like, we did a fantastic um, webinar with Sevi. Uh, he's a product manager at Backstage, so he, like at Spotify, so he knows his stuff, right? And we were talking about this sort of UX for platforms, and he was like, yeah, progressive disclosure. And I was a bit like, what? <laughs> and I, then he explained it to me. And funny, the same week I did a panel with Shmriti Patel, Shmriti's at Apollo, and she was like, oh, Daniel, have you heard about progressive disclosure? And I was like, I have not until earlier in the week, Shmriti. I, I really need to find, figure this stuff out. But it's about being able to disclose configuration options over time. Again, I'm gonna mangle it a little bit, check out Sevi's um, content there. But so the good example I have was if you're, uh, like say, spinning up a database, at the start, you maybe just want three parameters name, size, location. But when like the day two happens, I might wanna crank sort of under the hood a little bit and get a bit deeper, so I might want to expose more parameters. I'm progressively disclosing the config under the hood. Cranking the escape hatch, call it what you will, but there's a whole science around this, right? And Sevi was like just educating me on it, and I was like, wow, this is awesome. So build APIs, build UIs for progressive disclosure. It helps minimize cognitive load, particularly on that day one experience. I don't know if any of you have been given like a hundred line YAML file in the past where like, just fill out your values, it's all good. And I'm like, hundred lines of config? Like, what? <laughs> like, that's not progressive disclosure. It's a full disclosure, thank you, <laughs> BMK, thank you, indeed. <laughs> yes, don't forget the product focus. Um, uh, I'm gonna shout out uh, Sarah Wells, uh, awesome book. So Sarah built platforms at FT, Financial Times, uh, for many years, and I've learned so much from Sarah over the years. I did a webinar with her recently, and she talked a lot about, um, yeah, really like meeting your customers where they're at. And she's like, it's a font of knowledge, and she has codified that knowledge in this amazing book on O'Reilly, which I thoroughly encourage you to read. Same thing uh, with this ThoughtWorks. My go-to reference for Platform's product, if you want to understand a bit more uh, how these things join together, the ThoughtWorks reference, I'll, I will share. I've already put the slide deck up on LinkedIn, actually, on SlideShare, so the links are there for you as well. But these are really useful for understanding I'm building a product. My platform is a product. On this notion, what gets measured gets managed, right? I talked about earlier, like thinking about goals, and I'm gonna shout out uh, Camille Neen's book yet again, because I didn't have a mental model for this until I read the book. And, and I obviously knew I wanted to establish goals, right? I'm trying to you know, go faster, reduce risk, uh, uh, scale my uh, platform efficiently. But in this book, they talked about impact metrics, guardrail metrics, and product health metrics. And I was like, ooh, that's a nice framework, right? The impact is like business impact. I think Adora is like sort of lead time to delivery, right? And um, guardrail metrics are, in Dora's language, change fail percentage, that kind of stuff, right? And then product health is like, are folks adopting my platform? This is a really nice framework, because typically the way I'd look at metrics, I'd be looking like uh, lagging indicators, or leading indicators for platforms, like adoption rates, uh, onboarding times, time to nth pull request. This is stuff as we as developers should be asking for our platform uh, engineers, right? And then if you look at like lagging indicators, like app retention rate, and then these other things, the upgrade, like reducing upgrade cycle time, uh, speed of delivery is more impact metrics. Those are the metrics we need to sell up the value chain, we need to sell up that elevator, right, to use Gregor's language. The folks in the penthouse suite understand that stuff. We also wanna have these guardrails around change fail percentage, number of SEV1 incidents. Like if you are building a platform, using a platform, make sure you're capturing the metrics Dealing like a proper product, because that's the only way you're gonna really like learn what's working and what's not. Uh, and it's, it's really like, uh, when, when push comes to shove and like folks are like, show me the value of the platform, you'll have some numbers to respond back with, right? 
And a couple more references there. I'm going to shout hat to my boss there, Paula, sitting in the front row. Um, uh, like we did a great webinar, and you were talking all about this, Paula, from your experience with Cloud Foundry and stuff. So like, I think that really good uh, webinar there. And another EMAG uh, um, from the InfoQ folks around improving developer experience with platform engineering. This product focus kept coming through, being able to measure your impact, like make sure Dev and Ops and Dev and Platform are really communicating these things. Now, as a developer, I'm kind of looking for even more than this, right? And I think the Goldilocks, Goldilocks zone is in with the DevX framework. I like Dora a lot. We actually had in the panel chatting about the value of Dora, and, and the panel was kind of split. Like Chris Plank was like saying, oh, I'm not really into Dora, and Rachel, you were there saying, hey, I kind of like Dora. So like, it's, it's, it can be controversial, but it's, it is, I find now, like when I go into C-level discussions, they know Dora. Like 10 years ago, they wouldn't, right? I'd have to be explaining, oh, change fail percentage is this, and lead time to impact and all this. Like Nicole Forsgren and team have done amazing work, right, in this space. The Accelerate book is epic. Dora is epic. Um, it's well understood universally. It's great for communicating. But it is very delivery focused, right? And for us as developers, that's useful, but not always the sort of complete story. I hopefully folks have bumped into space. Again, Nicole Forsgren and team, and Abby Noda, I think a few other folks. I might be mangling the exact names, but do check the reference out. Um, and it covers all bases. Like the, the S, I'm gonna mangle it, because the S-P-A-C-E is like satisfaction, performance. I'm not gonna even tell the ones, I always get it wrong. Yeah, check it out online. Um, it, it covers all bases, but it is potentially quite complicated. I've heard developers like really latch on to this, but yeah, the, the, the ops folks are a bit honest, it's a bit too much, too complicated. I'm going to shout out the, the DX folks with the DevX framework. It's kind of nicely balanced, right? Uh, I'm going to shout out Abby Noda, Laura Tacker. I've been following them for years. They've got an amazing podcast called Engineering Enablement. Awesome podcast. Um, and this, for me, like, it focuses a lot on, on feedback loops, cognitive load, and flow state. And as a developer, that's the kind of metrics I'm interested in, right? So I really like this model uh, of, of, um, of, of uh, understanding what's going on. Looking pretty good for time, I think. So wrapping up, hopefully it's been of a whirlwind tour, you know, joining platform architecture to uh, platform, en sorry, platform engineering to software architecture. If I want you to walk away with like key things, these, these are these key things. Developers are the customers of the platform. We're building platforms as a product. It's a collaboration, right? We as developers say, hey, we need these things. And the platform folks have to say, hey, these are the constraints you're working in, regulation, compliance, limitations of the underlying hardware, that kind of thing. Please, please, please make sure you have goals for your platform. Pretty much speed, safety, and scale is where it's at, right? But if you're just building a platform team or you as a developer roll up to a place where there's just a platform team and like no one knows what the goals are, be very afraid, right? Because you're gonna be getting a platform, probably not gonna be very nice to work with. Enable APIs. Automation is key, right? CLIs are useful. I mean, I'm a CLI person, right? I love it, but I also appreciate folks love the UIs too. Um, if you've got the API, you can build the other things on top. Platform and software architecture are symbiotic these days, right? Collaboration is vital between dev and ops. Again, so many times in my career, I've seen people wanting to not talk to other people right? Like, I'm a dev, I'm not talking to ops. I'm an ops person, I'm not talking to dev. I'm a QA person, I'm not talking to anyone, right? That kind of vibe. Uh, and I've been QA, so I can say that, right? Um, like, it's a team sport. It really is a team sport, right? You, you have to um, sometimes minimize that um, communication. Like, Jeff Bezos is famous for doing the kind of, you know, the memo, right? The apocryphal memo with, we're now going to communicate only through APIs. But notice he said, we're only going to communicate through APIs. We're still communicating, right? That's the key thing. APIs, abstraction, automation. These are key, and I think we as developers and I get this a little more than the ops folks, because we've been building these things for a bit longer. Again, the stacks of stuff we can learn from platform folks, and I'm not saying anything against that, right? But we can often help platform engineers understand how to build effective platforms, and again, we can then more easily articulate what we need as, as developers to get our stuff done. Coupling and cohesion are universal concepts, right? And I also want you to think about these golden bricks versus golden paths. Again, it's still early for me thinking about this stuff, but I like this notion of a golden path can quickly become a golden cage, right? Like this is the only way to do the thing. Whereas I think golden bricks give you more flexibility. Again, early thoughts, love your feedback on, on this kind of stuff. I'll put that slide up. Unfortunately, I'm actually gonna dash for the airport now. I'm literally on a flight to San Francisco within like a couple of hours or whatever, so I'm not gonna be able to kick around. But if you do wanna um, ask questions, reach out on, on all the interwebs. You got my email address there as well, and you check out all like, the tools I'm working on at the moment. At that point, I shall say thank you very much for your time.